and it's great to be back in this building where I've worked for so many years. This implies something to do with autobiography. In a sense, it is. Uh, like all of you in this room, I was born at an early age and spent most of my younger time as a child. But when I was about eight, I discovered I was a scientist. I don't quite know how I did, but I wanted to know how stuff worked. And there are many of you in this room probably that feel like that too. You want to know how things worked. So when I first started to study uh, and, and look for a job, uh, I became a chemist. Um, and as you see, I was very handsome and rugged in those days. Indeed, I still am in a way but I've changed a bit. And I worked on DDT for a long time with a company in the UK who invented DDT, an outfit called Siba Geige. But DDT became unfashionable. And they transferred me to another laboratory uh, where I was working on the physical properties of organic pigments. Now, organic pigments are those things that make paint colored uh, and print colored and photographs colored. So uh, and they have very interesting physical properties because most of them are crystalline. So I started to do work with uh, crystallography, which involved microscopes among many other things. And there I discovered the power of photography to record scientific data and to use it as a means of communicating scientific ideas to people who weren't scientists necessarily and of interpreting uh, the data that you got through scientific instruments. Eventually I graduated, oh, and I also discovered the, the value of photography in making pretty pictures. This is entirely unrelated to my work, but um, if you melt chemicals on the microscope slide and look at them in the right way through a, a, a crystallographic microscope, you can make these rather beautiful photographs of, of crystals, which are just simply aesthetically pleasing. There is science in here, but that's not why these pictures were made. Well, this was very successful, and eventually we bought ourselves uh, a, a, an electron microscope which uses a beam of electrons to explore the natural world and to make interesting pictures of it. I don't have a picture of a, the microscope I used in my collection, but I found this uh, on the internet uh, some months ago. This, t this microscope, uh, which has a long electron tube here and lots and lots of controls, as you can see, is in a laboratory uh, in, in Russia and there's some student here while the professor is looking on. Well, I didn't much care for that, so uh, I transferred myself to this, and I thought, ah, happy memories. I had a great time with this, uh, this uh, microscope. It produced superb images, um, and uh, images that you can relate to as well. The professor, however, wasn't very pleased when I'd uh, uh, done this. So pictures from this microscope uh, look like this. This is a house dust mite. Um, the kind of thing you have in your bed. Don't think you don't have it. It's in your bed now. Uh, and its faces, when it shits, um, it, it produces stuff that people are allergic to. Uh, but the, as you see, a microscope, uh, a, a scanning microscope can, can produce very strong images of, of things like that. And here's another image that some of you may recognize. Uh, it's a, anybody recognize what this is? It's, it's, a vinyl, it's a vinyl LP, stereo vinyl LP. You can see that the, the, the modulation on this groove is not the same as the one on that groove, and that produced the right and left signal to your ear. It's remarkable, pardon? Uh, this, there's a scale on here, which is off the bottom. This is, that's 20 micrometers. So, so it's a, a perfectly respectable kind of, uh, uh, kind of scale. And you can also produce pretty pictures with a, a, a scanning electron microscope as well. This is a kind of Picasso style of cubist abstract. But then, then, in 1975, I was offered a job in Australia. Um, by this time, I had an Australian wife. Uh, one of the best decisions I made in my life. The other best decision I made was to come here to Australia to work as a photographic scientist with the Anglo-Australian Observatory. So I suddenly exchanged microscopes and electron beams for this fantastic device, which you see in the dome. In those days, in, in the 1970s, uh, uh, all, almost all the work on this, this telescope initially was done photographically. And indeed, when this building was built, when, it, when the construction was finalized in about 1970, before construction started, it had in it 14 dark rooms. 14 dark rooms. When I arrived in 1975, only three of them 
were available to me. They'd all been taken over by electronics. And that tells you how things began to change rapidly in the 1970s, how electronics began to, to blossom. Uh, I still have those three dark rooms. They're downstairs. I was in them uh, this morning. But this is the telescope. And when you take pictures with this telescope, uh, you sit at the top end. Now, unfortunately, the top end of the uh, uh, picture here is missing. But there's a tube at the top end of the telescope there. And it's in there that the camera is, uh, where you take direct photographs with the telescope. And that's where the observer spends the night, in that tube at the end of the telescope as it moves around the sky photographing various objects. And indeed, here is a picture of me in that, in that tube, ready to go. You can see it's summertime. It's uh, al fresco observing here in the summer. It's, it's, it's nice and uh, warm all night. In the winter, it's a different matter altogether. Uh, winter nights get down to about zero degrees here. This thing is made of aluminium, and it sucks heat out of your body. It's a very uncomfortable place to be. Uh, in this um, small chamber on the top of the telescope here, I have in my hand a plate holder because we use glass photographic plates. And you're going to be one of the very few people in the world who's ever seen a glass plate. We bought them from Eastman Kodak. They came in boxes like this, boxes of a dozen glass plates. Each plate cost about $60, so it's an expensive item. We've still got some downstairs. Since we don't do photography, I've opened this box today for the first time since it was made in 1984. Uh, and it was, nobody's ever seen these plates before. They were packed in the dark, they were made in the dark, they were used in the dark. But now, this is what they look like. That's a photographic plate. Some of you may remember film. Well, film was about that kind of color. That was the sensitive layer on which um, uh, light fell and which was developed in the dark rooms to make our pictures. After a lot of, lot of more chemistry had been used on it beforehand to make the plate more sensitive to faint, faint light. So time went on um, and uh, things changed. Electronics began to take over more and more. Uh, and by the end of my career, I was using this device, which didn't allow me to get into here uh, to take the photographs, partly because I put on some weight, uh, but partly because there was all this electronic stuff in here. And this was our first serious CCD camera, a thousand pixels square. But it could be operated from inside the control room. You didn't have to sit in the cage all night. You lost contact with the, sty the sky and the, sky the stars, which is a wonderful thing about taking photographs uh, photographically, but you were in the comfort and you were much more efficient. This was a thousand times more efficient than taking pictures with glass plates, but the area of sky you could cover, you saw the size of the plate, it was very large. These had very tiny chips in them, so if you wanted to cover a big area of sky, you had to move it around, so, and that lost a lot of efficiency. But as far as detecting light was concerned, this was the way to do it. And I want to concentrate on photography for a little while. Uh, this is a typical photographic negative taken on this telescope. It's of a nearby radio galaxy, the nearest and brightest radio galaxy. It's called Centaurus A. Uh, and this is how the negative looked. But when I was using microscopes, uh, I often used a, a process called unsharp masking, which is now built into every bit of photographic software everywhere, for exploring the very densest and darkest parts of a photographic negative. And if you apply it to this one, uh, you can see you can see much more structure uh, inside of this. You can see uh, 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 very faint structures that are all real and hadn't been seen before. So this was a way of uh, obtaining photographic data and extracting more information from it, which was of real uh, astronomical use. In the process, I also devised a way of making color pictures. And from those same plates, uh, this color picture of the same galaxy was used. And there was another process that I pioneered uh, which enabled us to see very faint features in galaxies of this kind. Unsharp masking was exploring the bright bits. This is for exploring the faint bits. Uh, and here is the galaxy again. And superimposed on this is a positive picture. You can see the stars all match up. A positive picture which show the faint outskirts of this uh, beautiful galaxy, Centaurus A. And that was a new discovery uh, in, 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 the in the 1980s, the fact that the galaxy was so big and so extended. And all of these are very faint and distant stars. Uh, 
the stars you see are here all in the Milky Way. We're looking through the Milky Way to the galaxy beyond. All these are the stars that belong to this galaxy, and it's clear that it's undergone some disturbance which has made it this curious uh, lemon-shaped thing here. This work went on uh, very effectively, uh, and a few years later I discovered something else that some elliptical galaxies, some galaxies that look like just fuzzy blobs when you look at them first on the sky, if you squeeze the images, if you amplify the images in an analog fashion in the darkroom, you can find uh, these, these uh, shells around them, these faint outer structures, which are indicative of a merger activity at some time uh, in the past. Uh, first of all, when I found this one, first of all, it was just an oddball, and there are plenty of oddball galaxies out there. But then I started looking more closely at plates taken on the Schmidt telescope across the way, and soon we discovered a dozen galaxies of this kind, David Carter and I, and so we published a catalogue, and that began a new industry of uh, understanding the, the, the nature of the mergers in galaxies. And with unsharp masking on this galaxy, you can discover many subtle shells on the inside. Of course, you're looking at negatives here now because they show this, these, these faint features rather better. So photography was a very powerful way of doing science in the 1970s and 1980s and well into the 1990s before uh, digital uh, detectors slowly took over. But the most interesting thing I found was this. Uh, I was working with some colleagues in the United States uh, on galaxies in the Virgo cluster, which is a nearby cluster of galaxies. Galaxies are gregarious. They tend to like to live close together. Uh, but unlike people, they occur in a very wide variety of, of sizes. And here is a nearby galaxy in the Virgo cluster. But what we were interested in uh, was these very faint, fuzzy things circled here. Oh, they're off the top, never mind but very, uh, very small. But by using the photographic techniques I alluded to before, uh, you can find uh, that they, they are, in fact, real galaxies. And most of these were in the Virgo cluster. In other words, they were nearby. So we were filling out the kind of census of faint galaxies in a nearby cluster, so we could extrapolate that to much more distant clusters across the sky. Uh, but this caught my eye. This, a faint galaxy here, but surrounded by a very large, fuzzy, and slightly structured halo. And I alerted my American colleagues to this. It looks a bit odd, what do you reckon to this? And the next thing I heard, this is long before the days of email, of course, was that they got some time on the giant, giant Arecibo radio telescope uh, in, uh, in, in uh, Puerto Rico. They observed this in the line of hydrogen at radio frequencies and discovered it was a, gi a giant galaxy, much, much bigger than the Milky Way, much, much further than uh, uh, the Virgo cluster itself. And they, they, they gave it a name, uh, which surprised me. They gave it a name uh, because they wanted me to find some more. This was unique in its day, and it's still unique in a sense. There's only four of them now all discovered by radio telescopes. But the interesting thing about this galaxy was its dimensions. It was a huge galaxy. Um, the Milky Way is here, but this galaxy is a billion light years away. The diameter of the Milky Way is around 100,000 light years. This is six and a half times bigger. And the mass of this galaxy, the mass of Merlin 1, it, it is about 10,000 times more massive than the Milky Way. And I think it's still the most massive galaxy known. The inset up there is a picture of it from the Hubble Space Telescope, which looked at just this central region. And you can see it's a spiral galaxy, which is all very nice stuff. So it's still an, in, an intriguing galaxies. Now, all these photographic techniques were worked extremely well, uh, and they led me to devise another interesting process, a way of making color pictures. This is another plate from the Anglo-Australian uh, Telescope. Uh, it's of a faint. Uh, a uh, cloud of dust, again it's a negative, uh, and you can tell it's dust because there are places here where you can't see stars, so there's dust in the foreground, and it's faintly illuminated just by the light of the stars themselves. Uh, over here is a galaxy, an external galaxy seen almost edge on. Now, if, you, if you copy this plate using a special process, uh, you can reveal more information about it. You, it's just a, a better negative, and from a negative, of course, you can make a positive. But if you have three separate plates of this object taken separately in red, green, blue light using color filters, you can combine three plates like this and make a true color picture. First of all, on the photographic negative, 
combine them on a piece of negative film. Some of you may even remember negative film, but from the negative, you can make a positive. So this is a true color picture of a very faint object. And this, uh, we, uh, here we pioneered this, this, this kind of process for making uh, informative color pictures of objects that were too faint to be captured by film. Film simply wouldn't, wouldn't do this at all. So I began to make a range of, uh, of color images using plates in the telescope, uh, often helped by my friend Steve Lee, who I see at the back of the room here. Steve and I shared much of the observing for making these images, most of which were made for scientific purposes. We could occasionally fit in a, a short exposure for something or other, uh, and the brightest nearby nebula was made with three five-minute exposures. This is the Orion Nebula, uh, which is a very beautiful nearby star-forming region. The UK Schmidt also, of course, was doing photographic work, much more than we were doing on the Anglo-Australian telescope. Uh, and it took, it took some plates from which I was able to make uh, wider angle pictures of the Orion Nebula. And as you see here, it's a spectacularly beautiful object. If you look at this through a telescope, even a large telescope like the AAT, all you see is this bright middle bit. And you don't see it in color. Well, some people say they can see it in color, but it's, it's almost colorless to almost uh, every human eye because the light levels are so low that the eye doesn't function well in color at all. Nearby in the sky is another beautiful object we've seen, seen before today. This is the Horsehead Nebula in Orion. This again is from the UK Schmidt Telescope. It's a wide angle picture of the sky. We repeated this with the Anglo-Australian Telescope. Here you see it overlaid um, and, uh, and, and enlarged. And if you think these are just pretty pictures, well, of course they are, but there is science in these images. This particular image, for instance, and you can't see it very well under these lights, but there's a faint fuzzy blob there and a faint fuzzy blob over here somewhere and something in here that you can't really see under these lights, but is there. Uh, and it turned out to be two uh, kinds of very interesting objects. Uh, one of them, oh, you can see them a bit better now. One of them is called a Herbig Harrow object. Um, well, one of them is called uh, hydrogen amorphous carbon. There is a, a reddish arc there, and that shouldn't be there in that kind of reflection nebula where there's a bright star illuminating dust. You wouldn't expect to find that. So that was an interesting discovery uh, indicating a place where stars were very likely to form in that, in that reflection nebula. And these other faint blobs here, the red one there, red one there, <coughs> are Herbig Harrow objects, and they're jets that young stars, still buried inside this dust, invisible young stars, uh, those jets are flung out, travel through space very rapidly, interact with the interstellar medium, and produce these very small objects. We, we're able to identify them by their spectra, but the, the uh, discovery was made by looking at uh, glass plates uh, in a color photograph. So photography had a long and colorful history here, a very enjoyable history. I've never had such a good time in my life as when I worked in this place. It was a very, it was a very stimulating place to be. Um, many, many uh, enjoyable working colleagues. I still enjoy coming here after many years of retirement. Um, and I want to just show you, to end with, uh, some of the images that we've made and the kind of uh, use that you can, you can put them to. This is the globular cluster. This is called 47 Tucani. You see it in the sky alongside the small Magellanic Clouds. It contains a, a million stars or so, and these stars are some of the oldest in the universe. Our galaxy has 200 or so objects around it, associated with it, uh, that formed before the galaxy itself uh, 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 gained its, its uh, present, present form. And I want to take you into a, a brief trip through the galaxy. This is now the Anglo-Australian Telescope, a very highly magnified and highly enlarged picture of a cluster of stars, the, the, the young cluster of stars. The young stars are blue, they're bright, they're in the foreground, and they're seen against the backdrop of the Milky Way itself as seen through the Anglo-Australian Telescope. We can take a somewhat wider view of that part of the sky, and we can see the cloud of dust from which those stars came. And as we go further and further out, we see more and more stars scattered across the sky. Now we're using the UK Schmidt for a very wide angle picture. This is with an ordinary camera of part of the Milky Way. And this is the wide angle view of the Milky Way you get on a winter night such as tonight. This was captured on film 
by the Japanese uh, photographer uh, Akira Fuji. And you can see all of the things scattered across the southern sky that you'll be able to see tonight when you go out. Here is the Southern Cross and the two pointers to the Southern Cross, the dark cloud of the coal sack, which is a nearby cloud of dust hiding the light of the stars beyond, from which stars form. And when those stars burst into life, they blow away that stuff. And then you see a nebula, like the one here in Carina, and eventually uh, even these stars blow away their stuff around them, and you end up with clusters of stars like the ones you see scattered through the Milky Way. As you move through the Milky Way, you see dust, uh, all concentrated in the plane of our galaxy, pulled in by gravity uh, into this narrow band in the plane. We get to see our galactic center uh, about here somewhere, but we can't see it, largely because of the dust, but also for the vast number of stars that are in the Milky Way. And it's from this dust that new stars are formed and new planets and ultimately new people. So this dark marking in the Milky Way is our origin, really, our origin. These stars eventually explode, and that will be our destiny too. We'll disappear, in, literally, in a puff of smoke in about four, four billion years' time, so there's no immediate need to get the shopping in or anything like that. <laughs> so this, this is our Milky Way, uh, seen across the southern sky in the winter. It's a fantastic sight, and I urge you to go outside tonight and see if you can see it. There's a bit of moon, fortunately, tonight, but if you find a dark night, you'll see just how wonderful it is. Well, if we uh, find out where that fits into a galaxy, this is not our Milky Way, of course, but that's where that kind of image fits into a spiral galaxy, seen here edge on. If we turn it round, uh, this could be our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, our galaxy we know looks something like this, but it's not our galaxy. It's a galaxy called Messier 83, photographed with the Anglo-Australian telescope. And in this field of view, you'll see there are some background galaxies, one or two there, and some even fainter ones, there, there, and there. The further back you look in space, the further back you look in time. The Anglo-Australian telescope is very well suited to that, but there are even more powerful telescopes with better resolution uh, and able to see even fainter things. Now this picture covers about half a degree of sky, roughly the size of the full moon, seen with the Anglo-Australian telescope for a nearby galaxy. With the Hubble Space Telescope, you see one-tenth of this part of the sky, but you see it in more detail. So if you now put our galaxy into its context and look at that part of the sky from maybe a billion light years distance with the Hubble Space Telescope, this is what you will see. And in this one-tenth of the dimension of the full moon, there are thousands of galaxies, millions of galaxies. Almost everything you see here is a galaxy. The stars are so far apart that you see one there, there's one there, and there's one off the top of the picture. That's the power of a t telescope above the atmosphere, which is able to see more clearly uh, and deeper than can the Anglo-Australian telescope. So that's the story of imaging from my perspective. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Fantastic. The question was that the previous picture, I think you're referring to this one, uh, the bottom star had spikes out of it, uh, but the previous one uh, didn't. You're talking about this one here? Yes. Well, that is a star, and when a star travels, when the starlight travels through a telescope, there are structures inside the telescope, like crosshairs in a sense, and light gets diffracted, gets scattered around them, and you get these um, spikes. Anything that's extended, that's not a star, like a galaxy, doesn't produce those diffraction spikes. So one way, it's actually one way to tell stars from galaxies in a picture like this. It's, a, it's an artifact, but a useful one for, dis for distinguishing them. Uh, in my career here, well, you know, it, it sounds as though I had the telescope every night. <laughs> 
on a good night, I'd get between six and ten years. Uh, on a good year, I'd get between six and ten nights, of which two or three would be cloudy. Uh, and in a good, really good night, we might take a dozen plates. So the number is not very large, but their the scientific importance was extremely large. With a good night on this telescope, you'd get half a dozen papers in various fields. And indeed, we used to offer a service to the astronomical community here. Uh, we, because some people just wanted a plate of a certain part of the sky, they couldn't apply for a whole night for that. So we used to gather all the requests together, and Steve and I used to work at no, uh, one or two nights dealing with all those requests. And that's where many of these color pictures were made uh, as a kind of sideline. So in our archive, we have something like 2,800 plates, of which we took, Steve and I, the, the vast majority. Yes, I'm still imaging. I'm retired, but still imaging. Um, <laughs> I'm doing all kinds of things as well, like talking. Uh, I, quite, I, quite, I quite enjoy that, especially about me, you know. I think it's really quite good. Um, I'm not doing any science anymore. That's certainly true. I don't have a telescope. I have a pair of binoculars. Uh, I enjoy looking at the sky uh, with binoculars. Although recently I was in Western Australia uh, with a group looking at some wildflowers and the sky, and there somebody loaned us a Celestron um, 810 eight, tele eight, telescope, schmidt cassegrain device, a really very nice telescope that you can set up in your backyard and see all this good stuff. I'm not trying to advertise it, I'm just saying I enjoyed that experience. So it crossed my mind that I might buy myself a telescope. And then it also crossed my mind that I live in Sydney, so there's really no point. 